Okay, the math professor is on the air once more. Greetings, fellow humanoids. Today we're going to talk about Chapter 8, Industrial Robotics. Okay, it's, this uh, chapter is divided into seven easy sections. And first we're going to define what is a robot. Um, robot actually comes from the Czech word for slave. And, and first uh, really appeared in a uh, play in the 1920s. So, an industrial robot is an automatically controlled, reprogrammable, multi-purpose, manipulator programmable in three or more ax axes, which may be either, either fixed in place uh, or uh, for mobile use in an in industrial automation application. Uh, all right, so why are robots important? Well, first of all, robots can uh, be substituted for humans in hazardous work environments. So very often we have robots that are programmed to do welding tasks, uh, uh, for example, that are repetitive. And uh, of course, that's one of the things that robots do best is repetitive work. Uh, we can get consistency and accuracy not attainable by humans. We can reprogram robots when we have a new task that we want them to perform. And robots uh, are controlled by computers, and so we can connect them to other computer systems. When we're talking about robot anatomy, we have a manipulator that is, uh, consists of joints and links. So joints prov provide the relative motion and links are rigid members between joints. So this is very much like the biomechanical uh, analysis of human beings uh, that we see. Um, so links are our ri rigid members between joints and we have different joint types. Uh, we have linear and rotary. We actually have more types of joints for robots than we do for human beings. Each, each joint provides a degree of freedom to the robot uh, arm. So most robots then possess five or six degrees of freedom. Our robot manipulator has two sections. There's the body and arm for positioning uh, uh, objects in the wor robot's work volume. And then there is a wrist assembly that orients the objects. So here we see uh, the anatomy of a robotic arm. We have a base, and that is link zero. Then we have joint one uh, that uh, allows it, uh, uh, link one to move in relation to joint zero. Joint two, which then allows um, 
uh, link 2 to move in relation to link 1. We have an end of the arm here, and that's where we would have uh, a wrist assembly and a uh, manipulator. All right, so what are the type of manipulator joints? Well, we might have a linear joint that is type L. Uh, we may have an orthogonal joint, which we call type O. For rotary motion, we have a rotational joint, type R, a twisting joint, type T, and a revolving type, uh, revolving joint, which is type V. All right, so when we talk about translational motion joints, we would have an input link, which is rigid, and an output link that uh, can slide back and forth. Right, so this is the linear joint type, or type L. On an orthogonal joint, type O, we have an output link that slides along the input link. Uh, so it can move qu uh, freely relative to the input link. When we talk about rotary motion joints, we have a rotational joint, or type R, that gives us a movement around a pivot. So we have an input link and an output link that is moved around a pivot, very much like your elbow. Uh, we have a twisting joint, or type T, where we have an input link and then it rotates around um, uh, uh, to get to whatever angle it, it desires. Uh, we only have a limited ability to do this as human beings, such as uh, our forearm wrist combination. And then we have a revolving joint, or type V, where we have an input link and the output link can revolve around, uh, around the, uh, uh, the actual joint. All right, so we have five common uh, body and arm configurations in industrial robots. We have the articulated robot, in other words, a jointed arm robot. We have a polar configuration um, where movement is, can be defined by polar coordinates. We have a selective compliance arm for robotic assembly, or SCARA, a Cartesian coordinate robot, and a delta robot. The arm and body assembly are all in order to be positioning and end effector, some kind of gripper or tool in, in, in the space that we want it to be in. All right, so here we see an articulated robot uh, that has a jointed arm, uh, right? We have a twisting uh, link here on the bottom, a rotating link is on top of that, and another rotating uh, uh, link 
on top of that. So they're saying this is similar to the configuration of a human arm. Here in a polar configuration uh, type of assembly, we have a sliding arm, our L joint here, and that is actuated uh, relative to the body, which can rotate around the vertical axis and also the horizontal act axis. A SCARA robot, uh, again, that's a selectively compliant assembly robot arm. Uh, we have a V-type link and an R-type link with uh, a, an orthogonal, uh, uh, ortho orthogonal joint that can be uh, used to uh, uh, assemble something uh, uh, in a uh, what may be a very simple or maybe a very complicated fashion. So we assume all tasks are vertical insertion tasks with this type of robot arm. Uh, the court Cartesian coordinate robot we have, uh, in this case, we have three sliding joints. Two of them are orthogonal. Uh, the one in the z-axis and the one, uh, uh, the, uh, one in the y-axis. Uh, we also can call this a gantry, gantry robot, a rectilinear robot, or an XYZ robot. Um, and uh, some work has been done on using this type of a robot for uh, uh, farming and gardening tasks. A delta robot has three arms attached to an overhead base. So here's our base with our arms. Um, each arm has two rotational joints that are type R. One is powered uh, and uh, uh, the other uh, is unpowered. So they're all connected to a small platform and that's where the end effector is attached. Okay, well, wrist configurations are wrist assembly is attached to the end of arm, uh, which makes sense. That's where we find our own wrists. Uh, then the end effector is attached to the wrist assembly. So our function of our wrist assembly is orienting the end effector. The body and arm determines our global position of our end effector. So we have two or three degrees of freedom. Roll, pitch, and yaw. And here we have a, an illustration that shows us what would be uh, pitch would be moving this link up and down, yaw would be moving this uh, uh, assembly side to side, and then roll would be having a twisting motion on this, uh, uh, on this wrist. All right, so our work volume, it shouldn't surprise any of us to find out, 
is our three-dimensional space within which the robot can manipulate the end of its wrist. We also call this the work envelope, right? Now this is no different than when we talk about human beings at a workstation and talk about their work volume or their work envelope. In this case though, it is going to be determined by the number and types of joints that we have, the ranges of the joints, and the physical sizes of the lengths. Okay, so that should make a certain amount of sense to us. Uh, so, our joint notation scheme, we're going to use the symbols that we had already talked about as far as type L, type O, type R, type T, type V. Uh, to, uh, and those will designate the joint types that we use in our robot uh, manipulator. So we separate our body and arm assembly from the wrist assembly with a colon. So here we have the example um, uh, TLR colon TR. All right, so here we have joint notations for five arm and body configurations. Uh, the first configuration is articulated. Our notation is TRR, and the work volume is a par partial sphere. Uh, the second configuration is polar. There are Notation is going to be TRL. Again, it's a partial sphere. Our SCARA, the notation is going to be a VRO. And in that case, our work volume is cylindrical. A co Cartesian coordinate configuration is an OOO and that works within a rectangular solid. And our delta type configuration is known as a three uh, parenthesis RRU right parenthesis inside a hemisphere. Uh, uh, okay, so RU means that our second, uh, ro uh, our second rotating joint is unpowered. All right, so what are some ways that we might drive these joints to do their job? Well, uh, the first is electric using electric motors to actuate the joints that is the usual drive system in today's robotics. Hydraulic would use hydraulic pistons and rotary vane actuators uh, to drive the joints. That, uh, those are noted for uh, being able to use high power and lift capacity. A pneumatic, uh, typically we would use that in smaller robots and very simple material transfer uh, applications. Now, of course, we're going to use sensors in conjunction with our robotics. We have two basic categories of sensors. 
that we use in the industrial robotics. One is internal that measures the movement and the velocity of the manipulator joints in the way, uh, same way that your proprioception system does within the human body. The second type is external, and that coordinates the operation of the robot with other equipment inside the work cell. So we might have tactile, in other words, touch sensors and force sensors, so that a uh, uh, so that a robot can uh, know when it is. Uh, contacting something or something is in contact with another piece of equipment. Proximity, so that a, uh, we have a signal when something is close to the sensor. Optical, uh, well that seems pretty straightforward. They didn't even bother uh, putting an explanation behind that. Uh, machine vision, uh, uh, this is something that they've been working on for years. Uh, of course, that's doing better and better. And we might have other types of sensors, a temperature sensor, a voltage sensor, magnetism type sensor. Uh, oh, the list could go on for seconds more. All right, so when we talk about robot control systems, we may have a limited se uh, sequence control. These are usually pick and place operations where we have mechanical stops that set the uh, positions, right? So that mechanical stop might be a physical stop that stops the uh, arm from moving past a certain point, or it might be a limit switch. Uh, we can have uh, uh, playback with point-to-point -point control. So in other words, we record the work cycle as a sequence of different points, and bloody hell, one second please. Hello. Yes ma'am. Perfect, I can hardly wait. <laughs> All right, great, thank you very much. Uh, okay, I'll see you then, thank you. Bye. Bloody hell, having a tooth out tomorrow, uh, which is actually why we're not going to have class tomorrow. Uh, I'm uh, going to have to be in Farmington at the time class would be. But don't worry, I'll leave you plenty of exciting stuff on Moodle so that you won't miss me a bit. All right, uh, playback with point-to-point -point control. In this case, the, we're recording the work cycle as a sequence of points and then uh, the robot is, uh, records those points and plays them back to execute the program. Playback with continuous path control, that implies a greater memory uh, capacity uh, and the ability to interpolate to execute a path 
uh, in addition to just a point-to-point -point situation. And then intelligent control, uh, the robot um, arm or the robot is able to show us behavior that makes it seem as though it's intelligent. Um, so it's responding to sensor inputs, it makes decisions based on those, and it communicates with humans. Um, although probably not in the traditional, um, uh, uh, traditional uh, we obey kind of Dalek fashion for those of you who are fans of Doctor Who. All right, so a robot control system, this is the hierarchical structure that we would expect to have in a robot uh, uh, controller. So we have a program storage, right, because it's rare that we're just going to have one program and that's all that uh, a robot does all day. Right? So we have uh, input and output into the executive processor. Some of that input is going to go into a program storage. Uh, some of it may be to modify a program that's already there. We have a computational processor over here. And all of this controls every joint of the robot, right? And that includes, of course, the manipulators. The end effectors, again, those are the tooling uh, at the end of a robot arm that lets it perform a task, right? That might be a little vacuum cup that allows it to pick something up and move it. Um, when I worked at the Center for Automatic Identification uh, at Ohio University, we actually had robots that were passing uh, uh, little carriers that we made by uh, uh, barcode readers and the little carriers had barcodes on them. So that we were accumulating data uh, over and over again on, uh, on reading different types of barcodes. All right, so we have two types. We have grippers. Yeah, like I said, it might be a vacuum cup. It might be something that works very much like your fingers. Um, they grasp and manipulate the objects during the work cycle. Or we might have tools that just perform a process. It could be spot welding, it could be spray painting, uh, it could be screwing in uh, screws. Uh, uh, that's actually uh, uh, all available to us. Here we see a robot mechanical gripper. You can see that this is uh, uh, kind of simple. It's just got two uh, grasping uh, parts that come together uh, to hold something. Um, and, uh, well, I'm I'm unsure what else to say about that. Now, we do have advances in mechanical grippers. Uh, we have uh, dual grippers now. Uh, we have interchangeable fingers. You notice how much of the uh, discussion about uh, the different parts of robots 
uh, is uh, human-centered, right? We talk about joints, we talk about arms, we talk about fingers. So we might have interchangeable fingers, sensory feedback, so they can sense the presence of the object and apply a specified force on the object. Uh, we might have a multi-fingered gripper, uh, similar to the human hand, but of course, we're not stuck with the kind of five fingers, one opposable thumb idea that we have with a human hand. We might be, um, uh, we might design something where the fingers are evenly spaced around the gripper uh, or similar to a human hand but has two thumbs. And we may have standard grippers so that we don't have to uh, custom design things uh, for every different part and or uh, purpose. All right, so what are we going to use industrial robots for? Basically, we have three different things that we're doing. One is material handling applications. Uh, it might be a material transfer uh, where we're doing a pick and place with the robot or we're do, doing using a robot to do palletizing. It could be machine loading and or unloading, uh, right, so that we have a CNC machine, uh, we have a robot that can load and unload the parts. That means that we have eliminated humans from having to work with that process unless there's a machine jam of some kind. Processing operations, uh, spot welding, continuous arc welding. Uh, robots are very useful for this. Welding uh, can be very hard on human beings. They get burned, they burn their retinas. And let me tell you, getting a burned retina is no joke. You wake up at three in the morning and you feel like your eyes are filled with sand. Not fun. We can do spray coatings, uh, whether that's a spray painting type of thing or coating something with a plasticized uh, kind of thing. Um, and a robot can work with materials that would be extremely, extremely dangerous for human beings. Uh, other things that we can do, water jet cutting, laser cutting, uh, uh, automated grinding. Uh, uh, again, all of these uh, the robots can do with great precision and repeatability. And it can do assembly and inspection. Um, there are some ways in which the human Mark I eyeball is still better than robots for inspection, but great strides are being made all the time. This, uh, this is not something that will last forever. All right, here they're showing us the uh, putting cartons on a pallet. Uh, it would have been more to the point if they showed us uh, the robot manipulator that was putting the cartons on. Uh, but uh, one of the things robots can do really well is stack things on pallets like this do the whole palletization, which can be a, a tremendous source of uh, injury to human beings. And of course, we don't want anyone to be injured 
if we can possibly avoid it. We can have a robotic arc welding cell. This shows a robot that is uh, uh, arc welding on these, uh, I don't know what to call them other than coupons, oops. Uh, a human being is coming in and changing these out after the robot uh, has welded them in, in this case. So as the robot moves from one side to the other, the human being then uh, the human being has placed these, the robot is welding them, the human being takes the finished product out and puts in new parts to be welded. Uh, then when the robot comes over here, the human being changes these out. All right, so often we still work where we have collaborative robots. In other words, the robot doesn't do everything. It does uh, some of the heavy lifting or the dangerous work, and the people then are uh, uh, the people are working uh, uh, with the robots to make everything happen. So the robot strengths, accuracy, repeatability, speed, lifting capacity, and tirelessness. Human strengths, intelligence, adaptability, problem solving ability. Um, so, as I stated in a previous class, automation traditionally has actually increased the amount of human labor needed. Um, uh, it just moves it to a different place than it used to be. Uh, this will... Um, this will last until we get robots that can fix themselves and other robots. Then what's going to happen to the human beings? I hope it's not Skynet. Those Terminator movies have made a big impression on me. All right, so where are some places that we might use collaborative robots? Um, well, one is uh, semi-automated production lines, right? Where we have humans and robots, and we leverage the strengths of each. Remember, using automation is always, always, always an economic decision. We never just say we're going to use robots because they're cool. If we always have an economic reason, right, we are going to be able to produce more. We're going to be able to produce with higher quality. There must be an economic reason to automate always. All right, we might have heavy lifting tasks where the robot is being guided by a human worker. Um, packaging uh, operation, um, robots are great at packaging because it's a very repetitive task. And the humans may come in uh, as far as one human may be supervising several robots so that if something gets out of place, they can move it to the right place for the robot um, or replace uh, tape or other things that uh, might be needed uh, as needed. Uh, we might be moving our robot uh, between locations for the robot to perform uh, its work cycle.
uh, right? So robots are not necessarily just fixed in place, always doing their work in one place. Uh, although some industrial robots can be very large and heavy. All right, so what are uh, characteristics of situations where we want robots to be applied? Well, one is any place that's got a hazardous work environment. Uh, some things we cannot uh, do without human beings that are hazardous. But as time goes by, we make better and better robots that can do uh, better and better exploring. Uh, for example, uh, when I was a kid, I kind of grew up with the space program. And the first robots we sent looking at the moon, uh, essentially they were taking measurements and pictures until they crashed into the moon. Okay, well, obviously that was at a very low level of automation and Right, but now we're to the point where we are sending robots to Mars uh, and those robots are able to move around, they're able to take samples, analyze them, send the, the data back. Um, obviously that's a very hazardous work environment for human beings. Right? We are working on sending people to Mars, but we're definitely not there yet. Um, it took almost 10 years just to figure out what we had to do to send someone to the moon and return them safe, safely. Mars is obviously a bigger challenge. Okay. If we have a repetitive work cycle, right? We do exactly the same thing over and over and over and over again. That is a good place for a robot. If we have something that's difficult for human beings to handle, whether we're talking uh, chemicals that might be uh, dangerous or uh, applications that might be dangerous, like spraying coatings or welding, uh, that is a good place for robots. Multi-shift operations. If we have a factory that is running uh, two shifts or three shifts, if we can replace human beings at certain jobs with robots, well, obviously those robots won't get overtime. They don't, uh, they might break, but they don't get sick. They don't demand vacation days. So they have some advantages over uh, human beings. If we don't change over very much, we're just manufacturing the same product uh, almost all the time and only occasionally do we have to switch programs to make something else that's obviously that well that falls under the repetitive work cycle to an extent that we would uh, use robots there if part positioning and orientation um, are always the same then why not use robot, uh, uh, robot placement? Uh, kind of our um, uh, polar uh, coordinate uh, type of robots. All right, well obviously we have to program our robots, right? Uh, we can't just put a ro set a robot up and say, all right, robot, do your thing. 
right? With a human being, you can give kind of sketchy instructions and, uh, and, they, and they'll probably say, oh yeah, okay, I get it, don't worry. Um, but with robots, not, uh, not so easy. So, our robot program is a path in space that is followed by a manipulator combined with peripheral actions that support the work cycle, right? So that manipulator may be placing uh, things in an assembly. It may be picking up things and moving them to pre-programmed positions, right? So our peripheral actions might be opening and closing a gripper, uh, performing logical decision making, uh, communicating with other pieces of equipment uh, that it's working with in a work cell. All right, so essentially we have three types of robot programming. One is lead through programming. In other words, we teach the robot by moving the manipulator through the required motion cycle and simultaneously we're putting that program in the robot controller so that it can be played back over and over again. Uh, right? Some of the earliest science fiction talked about programming robots exactly like this. That you would show the robot uh, or move the robot through the actions and it would memorize those actions and be able to repeat them. Uh, robot programming languages, in this case we're using a textual programming language that gives commands to the robot controller. So similar to other types of programming with software, we are, uh, uh, we're entering commands that will be executed by the robot. Simulation and offline programming, the program is prepared at a remote uh, terminal and we download that to the robot controller, okay? So in that simulation and offline programming, it's going to be somewhat similar to lead through except everything is done virtually. All right, so when we do lead-through programming, we do powered lead-through or manual lead-through. Powered lead-through we use for point-to-point -point robots, um, and we use a teach pendant to move the joints as we desire uh, to their position. And we record that position in memory, right? So we would, we would uh, move the robot, we would, uh, uh, we would punch a button that would tell it that's the position number one, then position two, position three, so on. Uh, manual lead through we use for continuous path control robots and in that case our human physically just moves the manipulator through the motion cy cycle while it's recording the cycle into the memory of the robot. Okay, so easy peasy. <laughs> All right, so we have advantages and disadvantages to this kind of lead-through programming. Uh, the advantages, 
it can be learned pretty easily by shop personnel, right? You don't have to learn a programming language. You have to learn uh, uh, to move the robot a bit and then uh, punch in that series of, uh, uh, of movements um, into its uh, uh, program, uh, usually by just pushing a button. It's a very logical way to teach a robot for humans. And again, you don't have to know computer programming. The disadvantages, well, first of all, there's downtime. We have to stop using the robot to actually program it to do what it needs to uh, do. You have a limited programming logic capability doing it that way. And it's not really compatible with computer-based technologies that we use now. Um, now, to me, what I would do is uh, to uh, make a program that can learn from the lead-through and program itself. But I don't know if somebody's working on that or uh, if that is something that they haven't thought of yet. All right, so when we talk about robot programming languages, these are going to be textural, a uh, check textual uh, programming languages. They're going to uh, give us enhanced uh, capabilities. For one thing, we have enhanced sensor capabilities, right? How do we teach a robot with lead through how tightly to grip something? Uh, but with sensors, you could say, hey, grip this until so much force is applied. Uh, you have improved output capabilities controlling the external equipment. We can get program logic that you're not going to be putting in pardon me uh, with lead through uh, methods. Because the computations and the data processing are similar to what we do with computer languages now, that's going to be very easy to grasp and to manipulate. And your program is going to be able to communicate with other computer systems, which a lead-through type programming will not uh, necessarily be able to do. All right. So when we think about robots, there are some different ideas about how we deal with the coordinate system. The first is the world coordinate system. In this case, we define everything based on the base of our robot arm manipulator. Okay? So we've got an X, a Y, and a Z axis. And up here at the wrist and tool level, that's all following the same uh, X, Y, Z coordinate system. In a tool coordinate system, uh, everything is defined as being uh, 
uh, as being uh, off the wrist of the manipulator arm. So we've got X, Y, and Z, and they're going to change as the position of the wrist uh, uh, moves. All right, so here are some motion programming uh, uh, commands and um, I don't know uh, 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 what to tell you about this uh, except that this would be kind of a typical programming approach uh, move to point one uh, here point one moves uh, point one uh, uh, on down the line, it uh, they make it look like uh, they make it look like uh, they're using lead through on this. Uh, okay, well that's fine. All right. We may have interlock and sensor commands that we can put into our programming. Uh, our input interlock, we may have to wait 20 before it's on. Uh, output interlock, signal 10 on. Um, right, so we may have an interlock that stops us from doing certain things at certain times. Gripper commands open and close um, that may be uh, uh, go through uh, 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 that may be partly controlled by sensors. All right, so our simulation and offline programming. Uh, when we do robotic, uh, robot programming languages, sometimes we're still losing production time because we have to define the points for the robot. Uh, right, so therefore we may have done a bunch of the programming offline, but then we have to do uh, programming online to make sure that it understands where specific positions are. But if we can do a true offline programming, we can prepare the program beforehand, we download it to the controller and we have the least possible lost production time. So often we use a graphic, uh, graphical simulation and construct a 3D model of the robotic work cell so that the locations of the equipment can be defined where we're going to put the parts, etc. All right, so when we talk about robot accu accuracy and repeatability, um, they say these three terms define precision um, and uh, they are the control resolution the capability of robot, uh, the robot positioning system to divide the motion range of each joint into the closely spaced points. Accuracy is our capability to position the robot's wrist at a desired location in the workspace given the limits of uh, the robot's control resolution. And the repeatability is our capability to position that wrist 
at a precise point that we taught it in the workspace. And that's it for our little uh, slideshow. So I'll take any questions. All right, I'm lying. There's no one here but me. So there will be no questioning. Anyway, this is the masked professor, and I'm out of here. <laughs>